Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Leanne, and I am with the People's Forum, and I would like to welcome all of you who have joined us today for this very important and urgent conversation. Before we begin, I just want to let you all know that there is an invitation available in both Spanish and English via our YouTube channel. So if you would need to, or if you'd like to switch languages, just go to the homepage of People's Forum YouTube, and you will find both languages streaming there. All right, so again, thank you all for joining. The People's Forum is a political education and cultural center based in New York City, and one of the organizations that participates in the International People's Assembly as well, a network of organizations across the world that is working to build unity and the struggle of people's movements against imperialism. Our aim is to, in all of our programming events and activities, strengthen and build working class internationalist organization and struggle here and abroad. The People's Forum has always been and will always continue to be in full solidarity with the struggle of the Haitian people who have led the way since over 200 years ago for liberation from colonialism and imperialism in the Americas. So for this reason, we found it not only necessary, but also very urgent to organize this conversation and to bring as much awareness as we can to what is happening in Haiti today. Of course, most mainstream media outlets will not show this, but the Haitian people have been mobilizing on the streets continuously for the past four years, demanding a transformation of society that would bring real solutions for the economic and political crises that make life unlivable for the majority. Since the end of August, tens of thousands of Haitians have taken to the streets to demand the full resignation of the US-backed de facto government of Ariel Henry. His response on October 9 was to submit an official request to the United Nations asking for a military intervention in the country. Only a few days after his request, a US delegation headed by Assistant Secretary of State for Western Hemisphere Affairs arrived in Port-au-Prince to meet with Henri and to reiterate the support of the US for his government. Other powerful forces in the region, like the Organization of the American States, the OAS, and Canada have also made significant gestures of support for this request. We must be alert that serious moves are being made to carry out yet another imperialist intervention that will further undermine the sovereignty of the Haitian people. The Haitian people know very well that military intervention by the so-called international community brings only greater suffering and misery, and they have consistently fought against a long and quite recent history of foreign military occupation and neocolonial control. Since the request of the Henri government, the Haitian people have responded with a massive and complete rejection of any foreign intervention, and there can be no pretense that this request is in any way representative of Haitian interests. Whether or not a military intervention, intervention is given the disguise of international approbation via the United Nations, it is a move on behalf of the US empire and its agenda. For all of us who believe that the Haitian people have the right to determination, the self-determination to a life of dignity for the majority and to a future that is built for Haiti by the Haitian people, it is urgent that we have a clear understanding of the current situation and a strong and a clear stance in solidarity with the people. To help us with this, we have three very important speakers with us today to share their perspective and their insight on the current situation, its causes and what is to come. We are very happy to welcome here Jackson Jean, who is a Haitian journalist with Telesur, who was on the ground and giving us constant and very essential updates that you cannot get in the mainstream media, keeping us informed of what is really going on. We also are joined by Mamira Duje Prosper, Assistant Professor of Global and International Studies at the University of California, Irvine, and the International Coordinator for the Pan-African Solidarity Network, with community movement builders in the US and the coordinator of the Leve Cante Avec IT international co coalition that includes organizations across the region who are all working to amplify the struggles of the people of IT. And we're also joined by Vijay Prashad, who is a historian, editor, and journalist, the director of Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, as well as a writing fellow and chief correspondent at Globetrotter and an author of over 20 books. Thank you all so much for being here and welcome. Uh, I would like to start with a question for Jackson Jean. 
the latest wave of mobilizations has seen people on the streets in huge numbers against the economic crises and now the threat of military intervention. Can you give us a picture of the situation right now and what the people are demanding and why? Primero, eh, tengo que eh, precisar que la causa de las movilizaciones. First of all, I would like to clarify that the cause of the mobilizations everywhere, including the Great North, it's a general mobilization that extends throughout the whole country. At the beginning, it started with a mobilization against the political crisis, a transversal political crisis. This is a crisis that's of political nature and it impacts the economy of the country. It impacts the social conditions of the country. It's a, a crisis and a project And the people of Haiti are fighting against the government's project, the regiment that at the moment that is in power since 2010, after the earthquake that hit Haiti. And the second mobilization, the cause would be this crisis in the political or popular sectors is due to a crisis that is a product of the intervenance or the international community that's intervening. People that can't protect their interests. And despite is being carried out or where it's born, it's not born in the political sectors, it's born on the streets because the streets is a symbolic place where the state can negotiate with the people or it could have this relationship of brute force and that explain why the country has been closed off for almost a month the people are occupying the streets for a month now in order to pressure the government that they consider illegitimate illegal and incompetent because since they've been in power they haven't done anything to solve the issue of security that is of primary interest to everyone since the country is controlled by 35 percent of gangs that have firearms throughout the whole country and with inflation, people are not able to have ability to buy their goods. Affecting families and people who help out their relatives and are, that are outside of the country. So that is why it's important that people are using the means of manifestations and protests and the fight first and foremost is against the government that considers that they consider that as a figure of international power in the country and after everything that's done in the country to pressure so we're trying to reach a, a power of consensus and what we're able to see is that the fight is changing course and in the discourse you could tell that they are attacking the government but they are shifting and they're attacking the institutions that back up the government that's why during these days the protests and manifestations are directed towards the french embassy the canadian embassy the u.s embassy yesterday this also explains how the people reached consciousness and understood that the people that are in power represent the group of people. And these group of people are the majority that at the moment are pushing for a new occupation in Haiti. Another important topic that we need to hone in is the fight against occupation. 
And at the moment, this is not a fight against military occupancy. Something that I noticed during the protest, especially yesterday after hearing a testimony of, I'm not sure I can recall their name exactly, but it was uh, somebody who was manifesting or was at the protest. They mentioned that we are already under occupation, but it was a symbolic occupation. It was an occupation of the mind and the narratives in the way that the information is spreaded, a cultural occupation. But when they see that these institutions, that these people that were put there for them to do a job and are not doing their job, they're sending in military troops in order to restabilize these control mechanisms that were in place in the country to control and defend their interests. So the struggle also happens behind symbols. We can observe many banners of struggle in the protest. And that is a way to say that before they used to say they were our friends. Now we're going to decide who our friends will be. I also think, and this is my opinion, I think that the struggle could also seem a diplomatic struggle, which I would call a popular diplomatic struggle. Because if we look at their position and also what Russia and what China represents in the UN's Security Council, the people are trying to influence the decisions from these world powers which in general have a more favorable position towards the struggling uh, peoples. And this, this uh, can support in stopping this military intervention that is being pushed forward by the US government. And, and this, and um, this, uh, form of government that is representative of all the people. And, and this last proposal that has been brought forth, even though there's a lot of differences in the Haitian opposition, there's a lot of things that bring them together. And that is the fact that none of them want, want Ariel Henry in, the po in power, and none of them want uh, an intervention. And lastly, that they want a solution by Haitians, for Haitians, so that the country can, can go back to the rule of law so that the country can move away from this current situation. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. John. That's really, really helpful and clarifying. Um, and we'll hear more from you in a little bit. I want to ask Mamira, Mamira, if you can tell us a little bit about the roots of this crisis. This is a multidimensional crisis that didn't begin in the last couple of weeks. So can you talk us through in, de in more detail the different dimensions, the political, economic, social, and security crisis that Haiti is living today and how it came to be what we're looking at uh, now? Thank you. Um, I think some of the things I'm going to say will um, echo some of the points that Jackson brought up and certainly that VJ will highlight for us later. Um, but I wanted to start with talking about the immediate moment, right? It's been a month, over a month, six weeks of what folks call pay luck and there's uh, the, the shutdown that are coupled with the protests. And typically when we hear about it um, on our end, it's sort of like, oh, Haiti's in chaos as if the protests themselves are the chaos rather than the result of manufactured chaos. I think that's important to hold. And one of the ma major demands that Jackson said is that Aliyah Henry, who is de facto prime minister, needs to step down because he, in a sense, embodies the state, being that there are no other counterpoints to his power. There is no parliament, or there's no judicial system. He alone with his cabinet of ministers decides, right, what happens. So obviously people are, um, 
furious about that, right? That this is a clear erosion of the democratic gains of what Haitians call the revolution of 1986 that overthrew 29 years of dictatorship of the Duvalier, right? Where folks were now really ready and able to make their own decisions about what kind of Haiti they wanted to build. And this wave of protests against IMV really, you know, we're always trying to identify when does it start, right? But if we look back at this January, 2022, several organizations took to the streets after, after some months of respite, right? Um, to demand of the raising of minimum wages, right? And this got some attention in the news here and folks were asking for the equivalent of $15 per day, right? So we have $15 per hour here, struggle in the States, right? And then the other end, um, you have right Haitian workers saying we want $15 a day to work in these industrial factories, making clothing for the Gap, for H&M, for Zara, right? So the question about solidarity is going to come up later. And, and one of the things I like to say to people, we need to rethink our consumption, right? Because we drive this machine in the end. Um, but essentially, uh, the minimum wage was able to be raised at 685 roots. I want you to keep that number in mind. It's about $7. And when these shutdowns started is when Aliyah the doctor, the butcher doctor, right, that's how people call him, was announcing that there was going to be a price hike in the gasoline, um, which would be 685 roots per gallon. So the minimum wage of a one of the best paid workers, if you will, in the country, 685 boots, is the equivalent of a gallon of gas. And this is against folks who've done research on the ground saying that people need at least 1,025 boots, so closer to $10 a day, to be able to survive, given that everything hinges upon the gas price of gas, right? Um, access to transportation and a variety of other right services that people need. So this is important to think about in light of this gas issue that Jackson said is really something for the shortages we're all facing all over the world right now for a variety of reasons, right? But how does it manifest in Haiti? I think that's important to keep this minimum wage conversation at the forefront um, of thinking about Haiti and how those two things are linked. But Ali, you know, essentially is now the, the, the face of the people's frustrations. And before we know many of us, when Levy Campe was actually more active, right? Moise was the, the figure of uh, people's frustrations. But really, these two men um, stand in and they call them PHTK3, PHTK2 for this party that came into power, right, in 2010 after the earthquake, essentially handpicked by the United States through the Secretary of State at that point, who was Hillary Clinton. And the earthquake became an opportunity to accelerate what already was on the books. So, you know, um, there are pieces written by myself and others that talk about what was happening even before the earthquake when you saw international um, interests align with the interests of the oligarchs in Haiti, right? So the 2004 moment becomes this pivotal moment where you see the struggle for control of the state apparatus. The oligarchs win, right? They get their coup d'etat. They kick out the democratically elected president. It doesn't matter the fact that Haitians had their own internal issues with it. That's our internal issue to deal with, right? But this was instrumentalized by the international to overthrow this government and to put in place what Jackson already said. People are fully aware that we have been occupied, right? The core group is established. It has a US, France, Canada, right? But it also has some other actors that are becoming important um, on the Haitian scene. You have Spain, you have Germany, you have Brazil, and the Organization of American States, but the UN, right? These folks come to constitute a council, really, overseeing the, plan, you know, the colony and essentially pick their puppets, right? At that time, it was Michel Martelly. And so that's important to note that the 2004 moment, and I'm, I'm sure Vijay will talk about the geopolitical interest that there is in Haiti in this 2004 moment. Um, so I'll, I'll try to stick to the stuff within Haiti. Um, but essentially, folks were already calling against the PHTK because of the failures of PHTK 1 and squandering $2 billion of Petro Caribe funds, which were supposed to go towards social programs, right? There's a, so again, there's fraud. Again, you have no counterbalance to the power of the PHTK. Even the first round parliament was very limited. Elections were always delayed to ensure that the executive had full control over what happened. So what did they do? 
they facilitated the scramble for Haiti, right? They divided up lands, they facilitated land grabs, and they gave several, you know, acres of Aped um, in 2021, a couple months before Jovenel Moïse is assassinated, is given 61,000 acres of land to develop however he sees fit, but you know, with one of his uh, contracts with Coca-Cola to develop stevia, right? The sweetener that we, you know, alternative to sugar. And so these are the things that the Akshika is doing, right? Emptying the land of the people, whether it has to be through violence, right? Or to false promises. And that's happening mostly in the North of Haiti where a lot of the agricultural lands are also um, desirable to put down, you know, structures, factories, agribusiness, right? So they need to clear the land and, right, there's, Piashik has given the opportunity to manage and manufacture chaos, right? So the chaos in how Dr. Ariel Henry is saying is the protest, rather the protest is the response to the chaos that's manufactured over the last 10 years with the full consent of the United States and these other international parties to the benefit of these oligarchs that I think a lot more now we're starting to hear their names circulating around. And the Brian Nichols who comes to town meets with these people. He meets with them because, you know, in the end, their interests align, which is to suppress the minimum wage, which is to vacate the lands, you know, from the people, which is to prevent protests, right? Which is why we see guns still being given to the police to repress. The police can't have a face off with the gang, but they're fully able to coordinate repression, right? So it's not that they're incapable is that they are not given the orders to do what should be done, which is to provide security. So when people say, well, we need an international force, it's because people don't trust the police, right? Some people realize that the police is in cahoots with manufacturing the chaos. Um, and so even giving guns to that particular state that everyone says is illegitimate, they're just another, another gang, right? And you have these different gangs operating on the territory. So, uh, you know, I'm. I could go on, right? But I think the manufacturing of death is part of the project, right? That you do need Haitians to labor on these um, plantations and to also be the pariah in the Americas to, to come to fill in right, low labor jobs elsewhere, but you don't make, need millions of them, right? So there is a genocidal project, I think that is at work here um, via the kidnappings, via the, the rapes, via the massacres that we cannot ignore and that it's happening in Haiti um, is not a coincidence. And um, so if you could tell me what, where, my, where I am on time and keep going. <laughs> yes. So I think that that's important to, to, to look back at the 2004 moment and to see how there is a complete consent of an invasion and occupation of Haiti because of how Haiti has been constructed historically. Um, and I know, uh, you know, there are other folks who are talking, you know, sort of poking at the international left to really question why is it that Haiti is always left in this exceptional place, right? Even when some of our, you know, the folks that we support have participated in the occupation of Haiti, right? Um, and that's, that could be its own um, topic. Uh, but I think it's important to see that the same players in 2004 who already were interested in the scramble, what I'm calling the scramble for Haiti, are still the same actors on the ground today, right? And they were successfully able to post 2004 and certain 2010 under the guise of a humanitarian crisis, right? To further um, take over land, right? Suppress minimum wage, right? Because uh, it's always where we know we want to attract foreign direct investment. So we need to keep wages low, right? Haiti isn't missing investment, actually. And it's not missing capitalism. It has unbridled savage capitalism, quite the contrary, right? So I think that those are the things that are at stake. And we see the PHTK, the, you know, there's an expression Right, so that um, that it's an inside job, right? That even though you have these Colombian mercenaries, you certainly have the U.S. That's part of it. Um, that it is also a, a fight for power within that party, right? To be able to be the chosen ones by the Great White North to be the masters of the colony, right? Um, and 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 so this is part of what we're seeing. And it's clear, I think, when Nichols comes to town, who he identifies as the 
um, Haitian people, and it's not the folks protesting, right? Um, that's seen as chaos, that's seen as disruptive. Again, disruptive to all of the projects that they have. The PHTK, and I'll end here, you know, their proposal mirrors much of the endless colonial proposal for Haiti, which is the four axes of development, right? They talked about mining, tourism, agribusiness, and industrial factories, right? And this is the program of the Duvaliers, and this continues to be the program of PHTK and the United States and the Canadian, you know, mining companies, all of the, the interests behind these, you know, states wanting to keep Haiti in this position are, is what here is being protected, right? That albeit all of these things, their contracts are moving forward, right? Um, I'll stop here. Thanks so much, Mamira. That's really, really helpful to see the material interests as well. There's political, there's material, there's, um, and it's, it's been the same players for so long. That's really, really helpful to understand this process. And, and to get into, like you said, more of the geopolitical context, um, we, we know that Haiti is the first nation in the Americas to liberate itself from colonialism. And since then, it has continued to suffer from neocolonial and imperialist meddling. Like you said, Mamira, there's the, the imperialist forces are not able to accept that Haiti determines its own future. So Vijay, I'd like to pass it to you and ask you to talk a little bit more about the role of the UN and the US in the current crisis and the history of foreign intervention in Haiti. And to clarify more for us, what is their interest and what can we expect to be coming? Well, Lian, it's great to be here with the People's Forum. It's terrific to be with Jackson and Mamira, um, both highly informed people about the situation in Haiti, a situation relatively ignored by people around the world, very little focus on Haiti, very little focus on centuries of exploitation and suppression of the Haitian people's right uh, to self-determination. Very little um, attention paid to Haiti, I'm afraid. You know, um, in 1962, C.L.R. James, the great Trinidadian Marxist, did a new edition of his terrific book called Black Jacobins, one of the great books written in English of the Haitian Revolution. And in the 1962 edition, um, C.L.R. James decided to write a new afterword. The afterword is provocatively called from Toussaint Louverture, one of the great leaders of the Haitian Revolution, from Toussaint Louverture to Fidel Castro. Um, why am I bringing that up? Haiti has a population of roughly 12 million people, roughly 12 million people. Cuba, not far away from Haiti in the Caribbean, has a population of 11 million people. These are two relatively small countries. And yet, and yet, from the revolution, the first proletarian revolution, not just the first revolution in the Americas, but in a genuine sense, one of the first proletarian revolutions in world affairs, from the Haitian revolution, 1804, that country has been suppressed by people who don't want to see that revolution succeed. And then from the Cuban revolution of 1959, that country has been suppressed uh, because people don't want to see that revolution succeed. Now, the Haitian people were not able actually to defend their sovereignty, to defend their revolution. In fact, the French and then the United States stole at a minimum 30 billion US dollars by making the Haitian exchequer pay for their own liberation. In other words, pay for emancipating people who had been held in slavery. Can you imagine? I mean, this should be a fact emblazoned on the US Capitol. It should be a fact emblazoned on the tower of the Eiffel Tower. I would like to see the Eiffel Tower have a big a signboard that says, we took money from the Haitian state in order to pay ourselves for the great feat of liberty, equality, and fraternity attained by the Haitian people. It is a standing shame to the French people that they actually made the Haitians pay for the emancipation from slavery. And then 
Haiti continued to be unable to exercise the right to its own revolution. There was a U.S. intervention, a military intervention and occupation from 1915 to 1934. I mean, the United States is classically defined by insanity, continuing to do the same thing over and over again with bad results and still doing it. You had an occupation of what, 19 years, 100 years ago, and you want to do exactly the same thing again, even though that occupation ended catastrophically for the United States. The Asians, again, trying to exercise sovereignty. What does the US government do? They put in place a wretched dictatorship from 1957 to 1986. You know, the Duvalier family, Papa and baby dog Duvalier. Boy, do I remember the struggles in the 1980s, the brave struggles led by the Haitian people culminating in a democratic process in 86, a constitution in 87. You had a grand democratic election. Joe Bertrand Aristide wins the election. And then what does the United States do? This great defender of democracy. They have Ariel Henry construct a fake organization paid for by the Republican Party's you know, Institute of whatever it's called in Washington, D.C., National Institute of Demo Endowment for Democracy, creates Ariel Henry as a, his political career is made in Washington, D.C., okay? It's not even created in Port-au-Prince. He's a product of Washington, D.C. This is now long forgotten that Ariel Henry is a creature of U.S. imperialism. He comes in and they do what to the democratic process which uh, John Bertrand Aristide and Lavalas was a beneficiary of. They overthrow him in a coup. You know, Aristide must be in the Guinness Book of World Records because he's the only person I know who has experienced two coups by the United States government. One, 1991. Second, 2004. And listen, friends, these two coups are actually responsible. These two coups, the coup of 1991, and the coup of 2004 are responsible for the chaos in Haiti. Not a man named Barbecue, not some gang named G9. I mean, these are petty criminals, many of them armed from the gun shops of Miami. Okay, that's not me, that's Bloomberg News reporting that Haitian gangs are getting their guns from Miami, Florida. Um, you think Barbecue is the reason for the problems in Haiti, you've lost your mind. That's exactly what the US resolution, draft resolution says that they put before the United Nations. United States never takes responsibility for the houses that it dirties. It wants to use its broom, which is actually not a broom, but it's some sort of bombing device uh, to take care of the detritus of the problems it creates. Barbecue is the exact exact symptom. He is produced by the U.S. coups against Haiti in 1991 and 2004. If you think barbecue is the problem and that a new intervention is going to solve this, you, like the U.S. government, have lost your mind. The United States government intervenes in Haiti militarily. It doesn't allow even this, you know, weak Haitian parliament, weak parliament, doesn't even allow this weak parliament to raise minimum wage, encourages this weak parliament to give away land to people like a paid, as Mamara said quite correctly, to grow stevia for Coca-Cola and so on. They don't even allow this weak parliament to exercise modest sovereignty over labor laws and so on. United States doesn't need to intervene in Haiti. It has already been in Haiti. It has been destroying Haiti. What we are saying is not no intervention in Haiti. We are saying United States get out of Haiti. Let the Haitian people breathe. Not don't intervene in Haiti. Don't send your Marines back to Haiti, but get out of Haiti. You've already been there because who's the cause of the problem? Again, just to emphasize this, in case you missed the point, the point isn't the gangs, the gangs are a product of the United States government not allowing the Haitian people to exercise sovereignty and live with dignity. The gang 
is a symptom of a crisis produced by the United States government. Trying to get rid of the gang is not going to solve the problem. What will solve the problem is the United States must leave Haiti, allow the Haitian revolution to breathe once again in the same way as the United States must seize its blockade on Cuba. From Toussaint Louverture to Fidel Castro, Haiti, Cuba, two parts, two chambers of our hearts as we look forward to a world that is not suppressed, but a world where people are allowed to breathe. AJ, for bringing us this history and also the clarity of exactly what is going on and the, the continuation of an ongoing occupation on the island. Um, I have some questions for all of you now. Um, one being, you know, we know very clearly what military intervention means for the Haitian people and also what it means for all people struggling across the world. The US is intervening, I believe it's done over 220 interventions in the past century, no? Um, so what are some of the solutions that are being proposed by the Haitian people? We want a Haitian solution for the Haitian people that's created by the Haitian people for a Haitian future. Maybe Jackson, but also Mamira and CJ, if you would like to also uh, add to this conversation, what are some of the solutions that the Haitian people are proposing and demanding to emerge from this crisis? Una de en las en, 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 en la lucha digamos en las movilizaciones in the eh, fights and the mobilizations I've asked people continually what can they do to solve or let's say to avoid and key the military intervention or occupancy and the answers were very shocking and this goes hand in hand with what I with what I recently said. They understood what the military occupancy, but they want to deconstruct the way that they're fighting. There's a new expression that they use in manifestations, which is wakali, and this word it's civil disobedience. And when they say this, that means they don't want pacific protests. When people say this, they want action. I was in the manifestation and the protest and the police started throwing pepper spray and somebody got close to me. They were a bit trying to flee all the, the movement. And they said they couldn't take any more pepper spray. I can't take it this way. If the police is throwing pepper spray bombs, I need bombs as well. I need pepper spray. I need my own arms. So you could observe in all the manifestations. That they're not even feeling pressured. If I would be in their place, from the first week, people started feeling, getting tired when they were specifically protesting and things, have, things haven't gotten better. Canada arrived to the territory, the United States arrived. It's like there's no result, no fruit to their labor. So people started thinking about alternatives and they consider violence. You know, to build off of what Jackson is saying, I think that there has been definitely a heightened um, turn to what some of us called violence. Somehow, you know, if you destroy property, it's violence. But when millions of people are dying of hunger, you know, that's just a regular day. And so there's a way, right, that we are projecting, and they're projecting images about what's happening on the ground that serve to confuse us, right? Um, there aren't people being slaughtered left or right by protesters, even if they are enacting frustrated, you know, violence in their frustration, they're not turning it against the Haitian people, but rather property. I think that has to be clarified. But then we see images of burning tires and somehow that's been put in our minds as like violent, um, 
and and I, I want us to rethink how we you know how we um, define violence. I think there are many different efforts attempting to emerge. There are certainly efforts that have been put forth in the last year by certain groups you know, who identify themselves as the opposition, either politically or as civil society. Um, I think at first I was sort of you know, understanding the limitations of this structure, but hopeful that it might be able to take on a transition that leads to the next step. However, I've grown disenchanted um, by how they have behaved, right? And their inability actually to embrace the protests on the ground because of wanting to distance themselves to be a better candidate that's picked out by the international. So at this point, is there a clear entity that we can point to? It's not there. However, I think in our international solidarity, if we maintain the position that the US has to leave Haiti, right? The core group, the members have to exit out of Haiti and stop giving the gangs guns. Because once they have no more ammunition, right? They're not able to continue to kidnap and rape and massacre. So if they're, again, not the problem, right? Symptom of the problem, but if they're no longer armed, right? And their whole purpose is to prevent folks from rising up, and it still hasn't been able to prevent people from rising up, right? When shit really hit the fan. I know I'm told not to curse, but it has to come out sometimes. Um, and so we have to get the United States to remove itself from the Haitian equation so that the real popular alternatives can actually emerge that are there. They're there, they're just not able to fully take room, right? People are not able, even though people are protesting, when you know with the lack of gas it also means mobility is restricted right for people to meet or even how people are feeling stressed out right that you can't um sit around and meet and really think and talk right there's those, those that piece is really fundamental to haitian people being able to translate those frustrations into not just demands but potential roadmaps out of the crisis and i think that you know it it is, it is coming. It has just to be allowed to emerge. And unfortunately, the things that are already there, I think have a great um, structure, have great intention, had a proposal for the transition moment that I think could still be considered, but the entity carrying it is, does not have popular support in reality, right? The, the folks of civil society that Brian Nichols met with do not have the political currency that it takes to drive this momentum into a new founding of, you know, the next step of Haitian, of Haiti. Um, so I think uh, and the international, if we're able, again, right, to affect that the United States pulls out, right, that Canada pulls out and actually stop fueling guns, right, via ports that are controlled, I gotta hit the oligarchs that are controlled by these oligarchs, right, if they're all controlling the ports and guns and the police, you know, the, the different centers that are supposed to be monitoring gun control, you know, gun control tell you that there's 500,000 arms circulating in a country of 12 million people. And where is it coming from, right? From the Dominican Republic and Haiti border, from the different ports. Who controls these ports? Who controls these borders? The state oftentimes via all kinds of agreements with the private sector that control it, right? So these are the folks allowing these guns to come through and distributing them. This is why we can't let the oligarch off the hook. We often, the international and the state, and then the, the middle group that actually stands to benefit, you know, in some ways the most out of the chaos, right? Sort of, you know, left out. And they're the ones who are controlling the ports where these guns are coming, right? So again, what we can do on our end and, you know, is to demand that the U.S. come out. Now, of course, it's a great feat, right? It's a great challenge for us to be able to influence, you know, the United States because, you know, we're still struggling to influence them domestically. But I think this is where we have to stand um, with all the nuances and understanding that it's complicated on the ground. I wish I had that like perfect, these are the people, they're gonna do it, right? Revolution of 2022 and, and you know, bang. It's, it's just not 
it's not, it's, we're not there yet. Yeah, so Lianne, you asked a good question and these are good answers. I want to come at this from another angle, which is that the assumption, because of the racist international media, the assumption is that in Haiti, there is merely chaos. There are gangs and that's it. And then there are distinguished gentlemen like Ariel Henry, Moises before him, these distinguished gentlemen who are holding the chaos together. This is a racist depiction of what is happening in Haiti. Now, for instance, this media, same media that's now so worried about the chaos in Haiti, did not pay attention to the fact that in a wave of protests in late January, February into March, garment workers, which accounts, by the way, for 90% of Haiti's exports, garment workers were on rolling strikes. Um, I would like to just inform people that there are some really quite good trade unions in Haiti. Um, they may have all kinds of problems, and I don't want to get involved in that. But there's a, the Confederation of Trade Unions, you know, um, I think it's called CFH or CHF or something. Um, they have 14 unions uh, inside them. FOSA. FOSA is a body created by trade unions to basically, quote unquote, save Haiti. There is a women's organization founded in 1986, um, SOFA, which is, you know, doing its own thing, building communes and communal gardens and so on across the country. It is a quite organized society. There are organized forces that were on the streets in January, February, and March. Well, let me say, and I don't want to get too much into this, but it's very interesting that when the trade union struggle was there and quite powerful, suddenly they were supplanted from the streets by the gangs. It is generally assumed in Haiti from people that I speak to that the gangs are also an instrument of sections of the oligarchy who basically use them as strike busters. Um, so let's face it again. There was a genuine trade union struggle. Where was the discussion in the international media saying, you know, the Haitian workers are desperately fighting to increase their wages above starvation levels, not even able to buy fuel, you know, for their homes and so on, that this is a very powerful and it could have been the kind of movement we saw in Colombia, cycles of trade union struggles, which bring in other people, communities start to join in, you know, the food price and the fuel price inflation galvanizes people. And we have a decent protest movement against the failed and illegitimate government of Ariel Henry. Rather than allow that to take place, suddenly the gangs are on the street pushing against the trade unions and taking up all the space. And then let's talk about international intervention. I'm afraid the racist media fails to let people know that there is a genuine class-based, genuine community-based set of struggles and organizations that are ready to provide alternatives to this nonsense that you see here. This is not a case of, if not Ariel Henry, chaos. It's not true. There are lots of other social forces in the country that are perfectly equipped to come and hold a national discussion on what should be done. And also, by the way, let the United States back off on its illegal sanctions a regime against Venezuela. Because under Petrocarib, Venezuela was providing discounted fuel to Haiti. And because of the intensified US sanctions against Venezuela, that was no longer possible. And you saw fuel prices skyrocket. These things are possible to solve. There are people on the ground, hold a national conversation. Stop the sanctions on Venezuela. Let them fuel up Haiti. These are all possible solutions. You know, an old CIA agent told me, if you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. The United States government is unable, it's a mediocre government, unable to understand the realities in the world. They just have their hanger, ha hammer and everything they look at is a nail. Every time there's a crisis, they want to intervene with the military. You don't need the military, guys. You need to back off. Yes, 
Thank you so much, Vijay, Mamira, and Jackson. Um, we are getting close to the end of our time, but I want us to end. Mamira, you already started this topic speaking specifically on solidarity, and also Vijay, you've, you've also breached this topic as well. But there's many people watching right now, and there's many, many people across the world that really want Haiti to know that Haiti is not alone. No matter what the, uh, like Vijay says, the racist international media wants us to believe, there are people across the world that are ready to stand in solidarity with Haiti. And so as we wrap up this session, what are some concrete things that people watching today can do to demonstrate this, to demand the end of imperialist intervention in Haiti, and to accompany the Haitian people as they struggle for self-determination? Um, I mean, you know, the things that we can do here often are, um, you know, these kinds of events, certainly holding protests. There are several different groups led by Haitian diaspora folks throughout the United States that are often in coordination with what's happening on the ground are making sure that they go to the sites of, that represent power, especially the members of the core group, right? So like keeping the pressure going, right? That we had a moment last year where there were a lot of folks internationally who were putting pressure on different sites of power, depending on where they were located. I think we need another wave of that, certainly continued. Um, you know, there are several petitions out there. There are all these different forms of, you know, ways that people are expressing to their, you know, voted elected, you know, elected officials their positioning and wanting to shift things, you know, within um, Congress. That's that's not my deal, right? I'm more like, let's go protest and, you know, let's, let's scream and yell. But certainly I think doing this political education work, right? Continuing to clarify the importance of Haiti and what's happening in Haiti. And I think, you know, again, one hour isn't enough, but I think, you know, BJ pointed to um, Haiti and Venezuela, I think, when you look at this 2004 moment, you know, I, I stayed on thinking and looking through Haiti, but, you know, this is also the moment of the establishment of the Alba Movimientos, right? That there is also a, a positioning that Haiti served as a way to create the chaos and be able to occupy it. And Haiti is extremely important, right? In the, in, in the exercise, um, you know, that people, to, participate in an organization of American states. In 2019, right, Moise votes against the recognition of Nicolas Maduro. And you're like, oh, that's a little Haiti, but all these little Caribbean islands actually were courted to be able to vote against Maduro, that they are still important within the geopolitical game and certainly a place like Haiti because of its history, its history and what it's been able to do. And you know, I, I don't think we can leave that part up, right? That that's very central to why things are the way they are in Haiti, why the chaos is being manufactured. Who is manufacturing it is like one thing, and that's the thing I you know I talk about. But the why, right? Is there's also the to to, to stick it to Venezuela to destroy Petro Caribe. There are endless reports by right wing. Um, you know, think tanks here in the United States identifying Petrocaribe as extremely dangerous, right? That now all these Caribbean countries could have other trade partners that are not just the U.S. and especially over a commodity as hot as oil, right? And so this is something that we have to understand that is part of why Haiti also looks the way that it does. There, it's at different scales that there's a reason and a commitment to create the chaos and to prevent a Haitian-led popular solution from actually emerging. And as Vijay says, it's there, it's being suppressed, right? That this, the work we have to do is to allow it room to do what it's already able and willing to do, right? That the gangs are there to suppress, the police repression is there to scare people into accepting the status quo um, and not being able to really um, develop, quote unquote, according to, the Haitian imagining, and you know, to stick it to Cuba, to stick it to Venezuela, right? That we can't take out that that's an important piece in the puzzle of destabilizing Haiti, and this is why we have to link these struggles in the way that I think you know VJ's work attempts to do, that I'm attempting to do as well, right? That it's not just core Haiti, right? Right, understanding what Haiti is contributing um, to the, in, in this geopolitical game against any kind of 21st century socialism rising out of the global South, right? Or not even rising in the case of Cuba, right? Furthering, 
right? Strengthening. Thank you, Mamira. Um, Jackson. I think that one of the ways, well, first, I personally recognize as someone who is Haitian that almost all of Latin America, uh, there's a lot of people who are, who care about Haiti. And I think that one of the things that can be done, first of all, is make visible this reality because we are at the war, our country is at war and war is not only a military war uh, that is being pushed by the US, but it's also, it's an, a war of narrative, uh, of narration. On the one hand, there is media that is showing that there that the military intervention in Haiti is to fight off the gangs. However, we journalists and activists of the people know that these armed gangs are financed by these same countries that are pushing these occupations. And by just asking some simple questions without doing a thorough investigation, we can come to these conclusions. We don't have an industry that makes guns or or weapons, this, they come from the U.S. because these weapons are being manufactured in the U.S. That's where this arm and the weapons come from because there is, because the U.S. is not controlling arm, the selling of arm, of weapons um, to control them uh, as they're produced in the U.S. So I think that this narrative war is important and that's why there's a lot of, a lot of alternative media, community radio stations in Latin America, uh, as uh, I also think in, in uh, North America, like Mexico, et cetera. And I think we should, exp we should explain to people the reality and that's an important aspect of solidarity. And another topic, is also putting pressure on diplomatic institutions, which they they don't uh, show the, this embassies in Haiti. There's this uh, group of uh, embassies that d do not abide by diplomatic agreements. So I don't re remember what uh, Geneva Agreement uh, Accord uh, they're not following, but these embassies, and I think having these protests uh, near these uh, places like they did in Argentina, I believe after 2011, that gained a lot of, of, uh, of track, uh, track. And I think one of the last things that I can propose is having popular assemblies. And I think that that's one of the popular tools that exist elsewhere in Latin America uh, to have these uh, public trials to judge, even in a symbolic way, those who are guilty, those who represent and maintain political power that, that is contributing and fueling this future disaster. And because one of the things that I'm still trying to understand is uh, interventions. If we considered intervention in 2004, many of the countries that participated had a leftist government. And if we look at Argentina and Brazil, they all had leftist government. So the foreign policy from uh, these countries are all uh, very different and uh, they're different from uh, their, their, their speeches, their discourse are different from their actions. And I think that we as Haitians, we just like we have Latin American countries that are in solidarity with us, we cannot always count on those governments because there's always contradictions with their policies and their uh, discourse. And that's why you also, uh, your support is important to make our struggle visible and to support it. 
Well, very quickly, Lyan, I just want to inform people of two different ways that they can modestly participate. On Thursday, um, Tricontinental Institute for Social Research, which I direct, uh, is joining with the International People's Assembly, which people must visit the website of the International People's Assembly, as well as Alba Movimentos and PAPDA, which is the Haitian platform to advocate alternative development. The four of us are releasing a statement, a red alert on Haiti on Thursday. And I would very much ask people to go to thetricontinental.org uh, to subscribe to the newsletter because it will embed the red alert. And we hope that red alert will circulate widely. It tries to explain the nature of this crisis. Secondly, uh, very soon, in a day or so, the International Campaign of Solidarity with Haiti will release a statement. And I very much hope that people will campaign on the statement of the International Campaign of Solidarity with Haiti. Um, it's very important to take these this red alert in these statements to your organizations and get your organizations to endorse them, to campaign on them. Look, if the racist media won't do the job, we have to do the job in our organizations. So I would like to see, for instance, trade unions in the United States and Canada endorsing these, um, these statements and defending trade unionists in Haiti who are having their struggles suppressed by the intervention of the United States and Canada. We got to build solidarity, peace, people by people, trade union by trade union, organization by organization. So please look out for the uh, four party statement coming out on Thursday from Tricontinental International People's Assembly, PAPDA and ALBA Movimentos, and then the International Campaign in Solidarity with Haiti statement, which will also release please campaign with these documents. It's not enough just to read them, campaign on them. Amazing. Thank you, comrades, for all of your insight. And we will we'll put the link to Tricontinental in the chat. We will be sharing the red alert and the statement in our social media. And I have a few other suggestions as well before everyone goes um, of a few concrete things also that you can do. One is you can do this right now. Just take a minute and go to the Answer Coalition website. That's Act Now to Stop Racism and War. And they are collecting signatures for a petition to put pressure on the US to withdraw from Haiti. Um, the link will be in the chat. The other thing you can do, if you have any cultural inclinations, because we know that it's not just in our uh, political sphere, but it's also in our cultural, cultural sphere that we have to wage war against imperialism. If you have any artistic inclinations, you can participate in our call for posters in solidarity with Haiti. We also have a link for that coming and you can find it on the People's Forum website. And also, we want to show that there is no legitimacy, not only to Henri's uh, request for intervention, but there's no legitimacy either for the US imperialist agenda across the world. And so one thing that we are going to be doing is collecting signatures from different public figures and intellectuals to show that we, as the, uh, that we do not have any consent to the US doing this in the name of the US population. So if you would like to participate in this letter, if you have Someone, if you would like to add your signature, you can contact the People's Forum via our social media or our email. And uh, with that, I want to say thank you to all of our speakers, Mamira, Vijay, and Jackson for this incredible and very informative conversation. Um, this recording will stay up on our YouTube so you can continue to share it uh, with all of your comrades and your friends. And please call, follow the call of our comrades here on the call. Um, if you are not in an organization, join one and join in the efforts to put pressure to end the imperialist domination of the world and to stand in solidarity with the Haitian people as they lead the way for the struggle for self-determination. So thank you all so much. Uh, we hope to see you all back here soon. And I hope you have a good rest of the evening or a good morning wherever you are in the world. <laughs>